Well, we are finishing up a series that took us through Advent, through here, through Christmas, all the way to the end of Christmas. Technically, Epiphany is on January the 6th, but we're celebrating it today. Our theme has been a theme that runs through the Christmas stories that are captured in the Bible, all these songs of Christmas. And today we're doing a song for all, and it comes out of Micah chapter 5 and Matthew chapter 2. Before we get into those texts, let's pray. Lord, as we open up your word, we trust that it's not going to return to you void, that it's going to be planted deep in our hearts and souls and minds so that we can love you and love others as we love ourselves. Um, may it be so. And pray, Lord, that by your Holy Spirit, you'd open up to us um, things that we can't see, um, open up our ears so that we can hear, soften our hearts so that they be molded according to your word. And all your people say, amen. So, starting in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem Apaphala, though you are small among the clans of Judah... Out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be our peace. And then turning just a few pages in my Bible to Matthew chapter 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose ahead of, went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Brothers and sisters, these are the word of the Lord. Part of what um, makes this such an interesting story is that Matthew could have included all sorts of details about the birth of Jesus, but he decides to include this one. In the Gospel of Matthew, there's really not that much time spent on the birth of Jesus, and this is one of the stories he decides to include. In chapter 1, he's included two different things. One, this giant genealogy of Jesus, and two, the story of Joseph coming to grips with Mary being Pregnant, And then here we are in Matthew 2, and it's the story of the Magi from the East. And as a reader, we should be asking, 
you know, where are these guys coming from? Why are they important to the story? Matthew has gone to great lengths in chapter 1 to tell us about how Jesus is connected to all these people from Hebrew history. And now he introduces these non-Hebrew people. And we have to assume that it's intentional. Like, hey, this is an essential part of the story, but what, what makes it an essential part of the story? And I think part of the key to understanding its essential nature is the quote from Micah 5 that appears in the midst of it. So I, I, I want to I build up towards that. The Magi have come to worship the king of the Jews, they say. And the, the current king, King Herod, is disturbed by the news and apparently all of Jerusalem with him. And the Magi don't say anything about a Messiah, and yet Herod calls together all these experts and then asks them where the Messiah is to be born. And they, in turn, quote from Micah 5, which is this lyrical poetry from the prophet of the same name. And yes, it mentions a location, Bethlehem, which is Seemingly why it's included here in Matthew 2, Herod and the Magi want to know where to go. But it seems that Micah 5 is included for more than just like a little direction on the map. There's much more going on here, more than most of us would understand. Because on the whole, we tend to be unfamiliar with the minor prophets but the original audience of this gospel would be fairly familiar with the minor, minor prophet, Micah. Because remember, or learn for the first time if you didn't know it, the gospel of Matthew is directed primarily toward a Hebrew Israelite audience. Not all the gospels are, but Matthew is directed toward this Hebrew audience. That's why he can include the genealogy that's included in chapter 1. Because they know all of those names and they know how shocking it would be to have some of those names appear in that list. That's why it's included after that genealogy, this story of Joseph. That a Hebrew audience would want to know, mm, how is he coming to grips with this virgin conception by the Holy Spirit? How is he dealing with that? And then this Hebrew audience would also understand the implication of Magi interacting with Herod while Micah is quoted. They would understand that one of the most prominent themes of Micah is this sin of idolatry. That, that Micah is one of these prophets that just sort of rails against the Israelite people. And when he's pronouncing this judgment, he attacks the people of Israel for bowing down to the work of their own hands, to sorcerers and soothsayers. And that's why it's important to translate this word as magi instead of king or wise man, because the magi were these, were these soothsayers of the time. And it could hardly be more significant that Micah is quoted in the middle of a section about soothsayers wanting to come and pay homage to the newborn king. The irony couldn't be thicker. The very source of Israel's historic idolatry is now coming to bow down to the real king. And all the while, the one presently in the role of king shows his unfaithfulness. You can hardly escape the contrast between the two, between the so-called king of the Jews and the so-called idolaters. One is disturbed while the other is overjoyed kind of continues this theme that God's up to all the time of disturbing the comfortable and comforting the disturbed. And it continues a theme that's prevalent in every part of the Christmas story, that God uses unlikely people of this world in order to straighten out the ones that are supposedly leading the way. It's actually a theme that's quite prevalent throughout the entirety of of the Gospels, right? That, a, that a, a woman who's been married five times ends up becoming the first mass evangelist all while the disciples want to sort of shoo her away. Or a woman of ill repute is washing Jesus' feet while the religious leaders of the day look on and cast aspersions upon her. Or, you know, a Samaritan who's kind of the 
despised among the Hebrew people is helping someone out while a Levite or a priest walks by. God uses over and over and over and again unlikely people to show the way to those who supposedly get it. God uses unlikely people over and over and over again to show the way to those who supposedly get it. And I think that's good news. Especially because I know some of you don't think very highly of yourselves. And in this present age of positive psychology, I can be kind of sad about that. I want you to have self-esteem. But at the same time, um, you may also be in the perfect position to be used by God. Because God, over and over and over again, uses the unlikely to show the way to those who supposedly get it, even the religious leaders of the day. That's even the way it was for Bethlehem, right? For Bethlehem. Bethlehem, the small town in Judah. Bethlehem, by no means the least, though. Don't underestimate that Bethlehem. Small town, but by no means the least. Big things are coming from that small town. A ruler who is the ancient of days will come from that town. A, a proper ruler, a proper shepherd. Shepherd. And this too highlights why it's so poignant for Micah to be quoted to Herod. Micah, uh, this prophetic book, is primarily directed towards the leaders of the Hebrew people. He considers them to be terrible and unjust, haters of good and lovers of evil. He relentlessly predicts disaster and disgrace for the leaders as well as for the nation. And the audience of the gospel would know this. And yet, you know, here's Herod, who seems to have no clue what the book of Micah has to say in general and what it has to say to him, about him specifically. All the more reason to consider him the primary adulterer, adulterer, idolater and a very poor example of a leader. And all the more reason to wonder about this child, this Messiah, this new shepherd, as Micah 5.4 says it. Um, you'll notice if you compare the Micah passage with the quoting of the Micah passage in Matthew chapter 2, that Matthew chapter 2 really kind of contains this amalgamation of Micah 5.2 and Micah 5.4 and not the complete version of either one of them. And it makes you wonder... If we have it recorded almost shorthand, but sort of the experts of the day, the teachers of the law that came before Herod, if they actually quoted all of, it, all of it, which would have really got Herod sort of hot under the collar, right? Because as you can see here in Micah 5.4, this new ruler will shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of Adonai, which I talked about at length last week, this whole the Lord, very specific reference to God, to the great I am, to the great tetragrammaton, the four-letter name that shall not be named. And this shepherd will give them security, which Herod had not provided, and his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, largely because people will flock to this shepherd, pun intended, they will flock to this shepherd from everywhere, which is precisely why the Magi are there and while Herod, why Herod is feeling threatened. Because this guy will be a shepherd for Israel, and since they're supposed to be a light to every nation, to be a shepherd for Israel is to be a shepherd for all people to the very ends of the earth, which is precisely why we call this epiphany, epiphany meaning to reveal or show, because this star appeared to the Magi and revealed to them to the nature of this child, the Christ child. And they are experiencing an epiphany. They're experiencing an epiphany. And what's more, this epiphany has this dual meaning because something is revealed to them and then in turn, they reveal something to the rest of the world. Their presence and their actions, they're the first indications that Jesus came for all people of all nations, of all races, and that the work of God in the world will not be limited only to a few. 
So they reveal or show that Jesus is the ruler, the shepherd, the king of all people. Their experience is a manifestation of Christ, not only to them, but then through them to the rest of us. And there's something in their lives that can be a model for the rest of us. Indeed, the story of the Magi is full of these age-old reminders, reminders that never get old, reminders that just might be sort of a basic um, guide to discipleship in 2021, the first of which I've already mentioned, namely that God uses the unlikely. God uses people like you to reveal big things to others, that you too can be an epiphany. You can experience an epiphany and be an epiphany. And the Magi serve as examples of more than just that. They exemplify the value of curiosity. You know, why are they willing to go and make this journey in the first place? Because they indulge their curiosity. Hey, what's that star up there? Who does that star belong to? And they pursue it. They take the journey after it. They follow the questions that are leading them in that direction. It's as though this gravity is pulling them and they're willingly pulled along. And no matter where we're at in our spiritual journey, whether we're at the beginning or we're maybe nearing the end or we're somewhere in the middle, there's something we can learn from these magi about curiosity. God often works the way he worked with the Magi, that not everything is revealed in one fell swoop. And so part of the journey is recognizing, oh, hey, there's a little light over there. I'm going to go see what's going on with that. And they pursue it one step, which then reveals what is the next step. And so part of the journey is just recognizing that and going and pursuing the first step Step And so we go and we ask and we seek and we knock and maybe a little bit more light gets shed as that door's opened. And we let that fuel our curiosity a little bit more and we pursue that light a little bit more and we ask, God, what are you doing in the midst of this? What are you doing in the midst of whatever it happens to be, COVID or not COVID? And what are you trying to show me and show us as a church, as a family, as whatever it happens to be? And then God steers us to the next part of the journey, and it's rarely ever just a straight shot. Often, where we thought God was leading us is not where we end up. And that's okay, because where we end up is often just where we needed to be. And God gets us there, Zigging and zagging like the Magi who stopped first at Herod's place. And I wonder if that's a posture for us to take in 2021, a posture of curiosity where we follow glimpses of light that are revealed to us. And I wonder if we can learn from the Magi in another way. I wonder if we can learn something from them about the nature of signs. All of us are looking for signs from God about the way to go. And one of the greatest lessons we can learn from this text is some wisdom about signs, namely that one of the ways to tell that it's really a sign from God is that it should lead us to Jesus. That sometimes we follow signs that we consider to be signs from God, and then they lead us into some really wacky stuff. Now, that's not to say that Jesus isn't in some unexpected places that are kind of wacky. That's true. Shows that over and over and over again in the Gospels. But even in those unexpected places, we should have a sense that Jesus is there. When we look around and find no evidence of Jesus, not even in the unexpected or the unlikely who are around us, then we should probably reinterpret the sign. And it's okay to say, whoops, I was wrong about that one. But part, it's all part of the process of being curious that sometimes we're going to wander off course, which is okay because the shepherd's there on the journey with us, nudging us back on course. And the course is always going to lead us to the divine, to Jesus, to, this, to things that should be, ha- have the marks of w- what Jesus' life was about. 
So yes, these magi teach us something about how God uses the unlikely, unlikely, and about how God rewards the curious, and about the nature of signs, and about the proper response when we encounter Jesus. And we see that in verses 10 and 11. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary. They bowed down and worshiped him. That same language that we saw way back in Revelation. They bowed down and they kissed toward him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They're overjoyed. They bow down and worship and they offer him what they have, their gifts, and frankly, also their very lives. If you think about the journey that they've been on, that they're not just offering up those gifts. They've journeyed from their hometown as people thought, what are you, crazy? You're going to follow that star? You're going to go do that? And then they come into the presence of this very unstable person who says, yeah, tell me when you find him because I'm going to come worship him too. And we know from the very next passage that's not the truth, right? And so they're not just giving up their gifts, they're giving up all of their lives. And as you're curious, and as you follow the signs in 2021, I wonder if we can just all follow this basic little tip from the Magi, that as we encounter Jesus, may we experience joy, may we bow down and worship, and then may we offer the ruler of all, the shepherd of all, that which is due to the ruler of all. And all of that then leads to one last lesson we learn from these magi, that they return by another route. That's the way the passage concludes, by saying that the magi return to their country by another route. I don't think this is just uh, one little piece of their story or one little piece of the Christmas story. I think this is a, a huge piece of the gospel Story. It's central to the gospel that once we've seen and experienced like when heaven and earth meet in the life of Jesus, once we've seen and experienced that, then we can't go back from whence we came. That we belong to another king and another kingdom and we're residents here on earth, but citizens of heaven and ambassadors for Christ in the places where we live, work, and play. So we can go back to our normal life as the magi seem to be doing, but they're going to go back different because something has fundamentally shifted. They're citizens of another country at that point. So they return to their own country, but by another route because something has fundamentally shifted. And if you engaged in the Advent process with us, whether it be through Sunday morning, Sunday sermons, or through the Advent devotional for all ages, then then you will have engaged in this spiritual practice of longing for the second Advent, longing for the second coming of Christ. And you will have stared directly into the present darkness and, and reached out into the light. It's a very similar thing to this journey that the Magi are on. To reach out toward that light. And if you've found even a little bit of it during this season, may you return to life in 2021 by another route. May it have an impact on you. May the epiphany that God showed you during the Christmas season shine a light into your soul that just won't, it won't let you go. And may you be like the the Magi, such that the dual meaning of epiphany applies also to you. Because something was revealed to you, and in turn, you reveal something to the world. Can I get an amen on that? And I wonder if I can conclude um, our sermon here, my sermon here, with a prayer of intercession. And I want to invite you to join me in with this prayer, uh, join with me in this prayer of intercession on behalf of the church, on behalf of the world, and praying then especially for those people who need to find a light and for those of us who have found it. So your parts are in the light purple up there. Holy child who made Mary praise and Zechariah sing, be born again into our world. 
Wherever there is a lack of awe, wherever there is no hope, wherever there is thick darkness, come, light of the world, and shine as only you can. Son of the Most High, whom the shepherds and their beasts adored, be born again into our world. Wherever there is fear of failure, wherever there is a temptation too strong to resist, wherever there is bitterness of heart, come, thou blessed one, with the glory do your name. Shepherd, ruler, prince of peace, be born again into our world. Wherever there is war in this world, wherever there is pain, wherever there is loneliness, come, thou long expected one, with healing in your wings. King of kings who attracted magi by the brightness of your light, be born in each person who raises their face to your face, not knowing fully who they are or who you are, knowing only that your love is beyond their knowing and that no other has the power to make them whole. Come, Lord Jesus, to each who longs for you, even though they have forgotten your name, Come quickly. And all the brothers and sisters say, Amen.